Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about genocide. Our guest, Ed Horgan, is a member of the board of directors of World Beyond War. <clears throat> he is based in Ireland. Ed retired from the Irish so-called Defense Forces with the rank of Commandant after 22 years service that included peacekeeping missions with the UN in Cyprus and the Middle East. He has worked on over 20 election monitoring missions in Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Asia and Africa. He is International Secretary with the Irish Peace and Neutrality Alliance, Chairperson and Founder of Veterans for Peace Ireland, and a peace activist with Shannon Watch. His many peace activities include the case of Horgan v. Ireland, in which he took the Irish government to the high court over breaches of Irish neutrality and the U.S. military use of Shannon Airport, and a high-profile court case resulting from his attempt to arrest President George W. Bush in Ireland in 2004. He teaches politics and international relations part-time at the University of Limerick. He completed a Ph.D. thesis on reform of the UN in 2008, has a master's in peace study, a BA in history, politics, and social studies, is actively involved in a campaign to commemorate and name as many as possible of the up to a million children who have died as a result of wars in the Middle East since the first Gulf War. Ed Horgan, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thank you very much, Davis. Uh, thanks for everything you've been doing and everything in that uh, introduction. What is a genocide, Ed, and are we watching one right now in Palestine? Unfortunately, I think we are watching one right now in Palestine. Uh, one can argue, in fact, that what's happening in Palestine uh, has been um, an ongoing act of genocide since 1948, a slow-running genocide. Uh, but now at the moment, what's happening in Gaza uh, falls very much within the Genocide Convention um, definitions of genocide. Um, the targeting, uh, the, the Israelis will say they don't target civilians, but in reality, the indiscriminate bombing of huge areas of Gaza uh, does amount to, uh, at the very least, war crimes. But, but when you combine all of what's been happening uh, between Israel and the Palestinians since 1948, I've whittled out this, um, it does amount to genocide. There's a spokesperson for the U.S. government who, when asked about Israeli deaths, practically breaks down in tears. Uh, but when asked about Palestinian deaths, says it's where civilians are going to die. This is what happens in wars. They are going to die. I wish it weren't so, but this is what's going to happen. So I think any claims of not targeting civilians when you're about to target civilians uh, is simply lies. Yes, I fully agree, and uh, also fully agree that the um, Hamas and others targeting Israeli civilians, uh, killing Israeli civilians, is equally wrong. Uh, one can understand possibly the reasons why they feel they are forced to do it, but that doesn't make it right. Uh, and the targeting of civilians in any war, or the failure to prevent the killing of civilians, uh, is totally unjustified, and, uh, and 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 the lack of lacking the ability to do it in equal numbers uh, doesn't make it right either. <laughs> the fact that it is much smaller numbers, it's still evil. Um, you know, Ed Horgan. Most of the time in Western corporate media, we hear about genocide as something different from war, distinct from war. In fact a common justification for war under the banner of responsibility to protect. And when I ask people, can you name a single war that's been justifiable other than World War II, which they've all been indoctrinated from birth in deep mythology about, most often it is a war that didn't happen that they think should have happened in Rwanda to prevent genocide with war, even though 
bombing is not policing. The horrors were created by war. The war that continued after that moment of unacceptable genocide as acceptable war was far worse, uh, et cetera. This is what they come up with as, as an acceptable, justifiable war. And, and we have seen wars on ISIS, wars on Libya, justified as, uh, you know, honestly are not, but with marketed as anti-genocide. And now we have Western governments and media cheering for this war slash genocide in Gaza and only calling it a war, not calling it a genocide. What What is your view? Are the two things the same? Are they different? What What's going on here? I think they're uh, intrinsically interconnected. Some genocides uh, are totally one-sided. Um, armies against unarmed civilians, as largely occurred in places like Rwanda in the Herero genocide, in what was what is now in Namibia and in places like Cambodia, uh, totally one-sided slaughter of innocent people. But war is uh, is used as a cover for genocide. Um, and the lies that are told and the propaganda, particularly about the responsibility to protect, uh, I've little doubt that the people of Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, um, don't feel that they were being protected by the US and NATO, the people of Serbia also. Uh, so it is uh, a propaganda war as well to hide the reality that uh, crimes against humanity and the most serious crime against humanity is genocide. And so that's the, um, the holy all of it. I know the responsibility to protect is not a law, um, and I know that uh, the world over, governments love to pretend that the laws against war don't exist. What about laws against genocide? Yes, uh, clearly the Genocide Convention is the law against genocide, but it is almost completely unenforced. Uh, because I was born in 1945 and uh, grew up shortly after the Holocaust. Uh, we were hearing as part of our education system that the, this will ne never again be allowed because the UN was formed to prevent it. Very clearly, the UN has absolutely failed and the international community have absolutely failed to prevent genocide occurring time and time again since the Holocaust. Um, and we've had the genocide in um, Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, I worked in Bosnia for almost a year uh, immediately after the war and um, witnessed some of what had been going on. And in particular, on one occasion, uh, I was involved in um, finding and partly investigating a mass grave. As it happens, it would have been described as a small mass grave. There were only 88 bodies in it. Um, but it happened as the, the war was ending, the Serbian forces were trying to evacuate to the Croatian territory. Um, a, a Croatian tank, probably provided by Germany, machine gunned a bus carrying 88, mainly civilians with some soldiers, killed them all, uh, and also killed uh, a local farming couple who happened to be witness to it, um, killed the horse and cart, the, the, the horse was um, transporting them. They were all bulldozed. Uh, quite close to the road. Um, and this is just one incident that happened and that I was experienced in Bosnia. Uh, clearly what happened in Srebrenica and elsewhere was on a much larger scale. Uh, but the suffering of the people uh, in incidents like that, um, you know, has made me convinced, first of all, that genocide is always um, unjustified, but also wars are equally always unjustified because there are always peaceful alternatives to preventing wars. And it's the failure to prevent wars that causes wars. Ed Horgan, is, is the problem that justice remains victor's justice, that uh, those committing these atrocities tend to win and not prosecute themselves? Is the problem that the UN was actually created to make some governments more equal than others, and that routinely for years and years and years, the US alone has vetoed 
the the application of the rule of law uh, in cases like the government of Israel? Yes, uh, fully agree. In fact, in my PhD thesis on the form of the UN, I set out to show how the UN could and should be reformed. And, and I hoped that I would be able to tell people how this could be done. I very reluctantly had to conclude after several years of research, the UN was virtually designed to fail um, and uh, designed to permanently give more power than is justified to the five permanent members, the US, Britain, France, Russia, and China. And the abuse of the veto is a clear abuse of the UN Charter. Uh, it's abused um, you know, almost on a monthly basis by one or other uh, of the five permanent members. There is no accountability on those five permanent members. They can do what they like without any reparations or any proper accountability. So the problem is we actually don't have a proper United Nations. Uh, and and why we couldn't need... we? Why couldn't we take away that special power for those five? Why couldn't we democratize it? Why couldn't power move to the General Assembly? Power move to a to a citizens assembly based on population? Why yeah. couldn't reforms be made? Uh, clearly, we we should. Uh, the difficulty is that the power of veto also extends to a veto over any change in the veto or any change in the UN Security Council. We may need to literally walk away from the United Nations uh, and put something better in its place. Um, that has been tried. Uh, I think the only one who actually, actually tried it was President Sukarno of Indonesia. Uh, he temporarily withdrew um, Indonesia from, from the UN. Uh, he was overthrown largely by the CIA uh, because of that. Um, but yes, uh, it, people tell us uh, that the UN is all we have and we must work with it. But very clearly, the UN has been failing cat catastrophically to prevent wars, to create international peace, and in particular, to prevent genocide. And that's a huge failing, uh, so much so, in fact, that um, I firmly believe that humanity should at least sideline the UN if necessary, and or else find a way of giving more power to the UN General Assembly over the UN Security Council, rather than the other way around as it is at the moment. The, the history of genocide, Ed Horgan, I think goes back long before the word was invented and long before outrage over the mass killing of so-called white people. Um, yeah. And uh, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, people, people think of genocide as a much too recent phenomenon, as well as thinking of it as being in the past uh, when it isn't, uh, in, in part because of the, uh, the obsession perhaps with, with having a word uh, applicable solely to one particular uh, genocide, that of, of Germany in, in World War II. Absolutely, and uh, there had been a long history of uh, you know, war crimes and abuse and genocide going right back to Genghis Khan, the Crusades, the Catholic religion, uh, just war theory, um, again, is a very flawed concept in my view. Uh, you know, even going back several centuries, uh, there was no real justification for any of the wars that we can examine in history. Um, so um, there is always a peaceful means of solving conflicts uh, that can and should be used. And yes, we do need the rule of law. We do need police forces, um, but not military forces engaged in large scale destructions, especially in the 21st century with weapons of mass destruction. No war in the 21st century is ever even capable of being justified, given the inability of these modern weapons to discriminate uh, against civilians or whatever. 
the the idea that yes we need police uh is an argument that i can tolerate a lot better than yes we need war which is the argument so many people make sure. and when you come to a war that didn't happen like rwanda uh the 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 line of argument tends to go here's why ignoring all the disastrous decisions that led up to the crisis we needed policing therefore rwanda should have been bombed isn't there isn't there a kind of a big leap there between the need to have sent in police and the need to have sent in bombs that doesn't get carefully examined because it didn't really happen <laughs> you know yes and uh, clearly after world war ii and the holocaust everybody said never again and again after srebrenica and rwanda they kept saying never again but there had been several acts of genocide in the meantime in Darfur and elsewhere and ongoing at the moment in Palestine. So they are very flawed arguments. When I say policing is necessary, uh, has to be policing based on proper policing, which the rule of law um, and minimizing any force which might very occasionally be necessary. Uh, in our local countries and in our towns, we do have police forces uh, who are, for the most part, fairly carefully controlled and accountable. Accountability for war crimes and um, genocide in particular is of huge importance. Uh, th there has been almost a total lack of accountability, so much so, in fact, that one of the reasons I would argue that genocide occurs is that genocide is perceived and in the reality to have succeeded. Uh, and that would include the European colonization of the Americas in which genocide was committed against the indigenous people, um, the Herero genocide, uh, e even the Holocaust itself. Uh, it is virtually impossible, in fact, to um, um, create justice once genocide has occurred. Uh, but there should be accountability on those and on the countries who commit to genocide. And I would argue that uh, there has been far too little and almost no proper accountability um, in most, if not all, of those cases. And yet it is almost universally understood as the very worst thing. In fact, I would argue falsely depicted as different from and worse than war, so that it's something worse than the worst thing and can justify war. Well, meanwhile, the planning uh, goes on almost openly. A anyone who says that the Israeli government wasn't openly planning and, and, and arming with U.S. weapons for genocide for years and years and engaging in it in, in slow process uh, it, it is nuts. And, and if the weapons that you need to arm yourself with and train with for genocide are the same as the weapons you need to arm and train with for good, acceptable, rule-based war, then how do you distinguish between the two? Uh, to a large extent, there is no proper distinguishing. And even in some countries, we see police forces being armed with armored cars and tanks. Uh, and that's an abuse of the whole concept of policing. Um, and the, clearly, um, wars are used to implement genocide um, and military forces are virtually always involved very directly in committing genocide. I wonder to what extent you think history, that is the teaching and knowledge of history makes a difference here. I can't tell people, I can't tell my next door neighbors that we need to stop the second Nakba because they'll ask me what the hell the Nakba is. You know, what, what if US children had ever been told about the Nakba. Absolutely, and uh, they probably don't even understand what the word means. Uh, and the history as well, um, in all our countries, inclu including the history of the, the Wild West in the United States, uh, the history of violence in Ireland, my own country, uh, it is quite common in Ireland, uh, even at the moment, to justify the Irish War of Independence and the civil wars that happened in the meantime, to justify the violence that killed almost 4,000 people uh, in recent times in Northern Ireland. 
they are not justified. Um, the atrocities were committed in the Irish War of Independence, in the civil war that followed, and huge atrocities were committed in Ireland um, by the IRA and the um, other paramilitaries. Nothing justifies that. Um, yes, um, it is common belief in Ireland that the violence that was inflicted, um, likewise in other countries, um, freedom fighters um, quite often committing atrocities uh, is problematic at best. Uh, at best, yes. What, how is Irish neutrality holding up during the, the war in Palestine, the war in Ukraine, the, the planning and conspiring to create a war in Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, holding up a little bit better than it was a year ago, our Irish government tried to, to they organized a big forum around the country uh, with the probable intention of bringing us into NATO or at the very least into a European army. But there was a significant backlash from the Irish people. Uh, our neutrality is in danger. Um, this, uh, we are very pro-American, um, at least pro-NATO as well, uh, or at least our government is, but the vast majority of the Irish people um, still value Irish neutrality and what I would call active positive neutrality in which we are not just standing idly by, we are actively promoting international peace. In the situation in Gaza and Palestine at the moment, the Irish government is taking uh, a more correct stance than it has been doing in the past. So um, mainly because the vast majority of the Irish people are very supportive of the Palestinian people because our history is quite similar. Um, and uh, the fact that we were colonized and abused and had almost what amounted to a genocide and the famine in the 1800s. Um, so, but it's a struggle to maintain our neutrality and that struggle will continue. Well, I understand it's an ongoing struggle, but that's very encouraging to hear some good news. Doesn't happen very often. Um, I, I hope that's a story you're telling. I know you have a book coming out. I don't know if the story is told in there, but can you can you give us some hints at, at what will be in this book? Uh, it's basically a compilation of all the letters and articles I've had published uh, over the last several decades and purely by coincidence or, you know, or otherwise uh, I just did a check and the word genocide appears in the book I think at least 97 times so uh, it has been on my mind and in all the letters and articles I've written um, the idea was to um, compile uh, letters to the papers primarily on, on human rights issues and uh, going back several decades. I've been surprised, in fact, having read it myself, uh, the extent to which I still agree with most of what I've written. Um, <laughs> there are times, uh, clearly, I think it's important for all of us to be prepared to change our views um, you know, on issues and not to be dogmatic because we said something in the past. But on issues of hu human rights, uh, I feel that um, what I have in the book um, basically is fully justified. And and what's the title and where will it be available? Uh, it's available on Amazon.com. The title is Writing the Wrongs of Human Rights in Letters, Words, Sentences by Edward Horgan. There's a play on words, um, uh, but clearly uh, I would also argue that it's not just enough to talk about stuff uh, and to campaign and to um, write about it, we also need to take actions to prevent the injustices and the human rights abuses that are happening throughout the world. So a combination of uh, communicating, uh, talking and writing, but taking positive actions in, in various ways. What do you recommend that people do right now who are changing their minds and who are becoming increasingly concerned about the wars slash genocides uh, that we're seeing on, on televisions and in newspapers? Yes, uh, it's not enough just to wring our hands and say, um, what can I, I can do nothing as an individual. 
I strongly disagree. Uh, I think we all can do a huge amount. One of my mottos is, whatever you do, don't do nothing, in fact. Uh, contact your uh, politicians uh, and take part in protests. Um, and sometimes, and I've been involved in several arrestable protests. I have been prosecuted, um, I think, seven times so far. Uh, up to very recently, in fact, uh, I was almost embarrassed. I had never been convicted uh, of uh, prosecution. Uh, that changed a little bit recently when uh, I went into Shannon Airport and wrote some graffiti on a US military plane um, saying, danger, danger, do not fly. Uh, I was found not guilty of criminal damage, but found guilty of the trespass that was necessary to go in to try and search the plane. So, um, and in some respects, uh, I'm almost proud to have such a conviction. Well, as we speak, you know, our colleagues in World Beyond War are shutting down a, a weapons factory in Toronto, Canada, that is supplying the government of Israel. Uh, and uh, increasingly, uh, the count is going up as we speak, the number of people being arrested. Um, I would I would encourage people to join with World Beyond War, where Ed is a board member and I'm the executive director. Uh, and join or start a local chapter and do educational and activist events and and raise awareness and lobby and push and block the doors of the weapons companies uh it it seems to get attention and make national news in those nations that have functioning communication systems uh and at least make some little ripples in the in the other places we've we, we've got just a couple minutes left ed how can what do you recommend to people uh, beyond what you've said and how can people keep up with you and, and follow what you're doing? Well, as I say, we have to use modern communication systems as well. Uh, and I would strongly support the actions you know, of the members who do take arrestable actions. Uh, it's particularly appropriate, in fact, for our older generation, uh, particularly those of us who are retired. Uh, our generation have caused many of the problems uh, that the world is experiencing at the moment, including climate change, which is a huge problem and is connected with wars and violence also. Um, so, and uh, one of the advantages of being retired is that you can't be fired from your job. And if you spend some time in prison, well, at least um, hopefully the prisons will be reasonably comfortable. Um, but uh, there is much that everybody can and should do uh and i say whatever you do don't do nothing uh and don't give in to the the lie almost that us as individuals can do nothing it is individuals who populate the world um who do wrong in the world but also who can make the world a better place to live in well, definitely don't do nothing, but also don't do something in the meaning of CNN, which is war, is to do something, Absolutely. bomb Absolutely. something. Uh, we've been speaking with the great peace activist Ed Horgan, who is a board member at World Beyond War, international secretary with the Irish Peace and Neutrality Alliance, chairperson and founder of Veterans for Peace Ireland, and a peace activist with Shannon Watch. Ed, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. And thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be on your program and keep up the good work with World Beyond War. We need to get beyond war very urgently and find peaceful ways of making the world a better place. So thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.